Welcome to today's session, and thank you for joining us at this year's ISC West virtual event. Please enjoy a few brief videos from our sponsors, and your session will begin after these next messages. At Synex, we take partnership seriously. Our job is to make yours easier. That means making sure all your product arrives on time. Financing your biggest jobs. Augmenting your service offerings. Providing sales trainings. That's what we do. It's actually not as hard as one might think when you have the best vendors, the best services, the best pre and post sales support, the best financing solutions, the best people, and the best integration partners and customers in the world. Synex. We power your business and are excited to do it. Hi, my name is William Malik, and I'm a VP for Infrastructure Strategies at uh, Trend Micro. Uh, my topic today is protecting against cyber physical attacks. And the way this session is going to work is this first part is uh, pre recorded, uh, but we want you to provide questions because after we get through this pre recorded material, uh, I will be joining live, uh, possibly in a cleaner shirt. Uh, to uh, answer any questions that you might have during the course of the material. Uh, so I've been with Trend Micro for three years. I've been in information technology for uh, 46 years. Uh, half of that time has been in uh, information security particularly. And recently, my interest has been drawn to the significant range of vulnerabilities, the dramatic increase in the enterprise attack surface caused by the uh, convergence of uh, classical IT with the physical 
uh, industrial control systems or OT as it's uh, you know, generally known. So what we're gonna do in the course of this presentation is the first part we're gonna talk about is the OT environment and then we're gonna go into the industrial characteristics of that environment, what you'll see in factories and warehouses and such. And then we're gonna move into the home environment and we're gonna take a look at the connected home and the risks associated in that space. And then we're gonna close with some concrete recommendations uh, that you can take to improve the cybersecurity of your environment. Now it's crucial to do this for a couple of reasons. First, we want to be able to preserve our own privacy, our own intellectual property. We wanna keep our uh, financial information safe. We wanna avoid ransomware. We do not wanna be expanding the attack surface. And that gets into the second one, which is the enterprises of which we are part uh, are depending on us uh, because our presence on the internet actually extends their attack surface. And so an attack against me could be an attack against my company. I'm phished, and as a result, ransomware gets into the network. And so it's this expanded um, attack surface. It's this increasing range of vulnerabilities that's gonna be what's driving this talk. So with that said, uh, we'll begin. Um, first, of course, a reminder, uh, you can always submit questions during this uh, talk through the uh, chat feature at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, and please do so. Uh, we will attempt to answer uh, every question that, uh, that comes up. So let's look at the complex IoT environment we see in the manufacturing world. Uh, this diagram about um, industrial control systems uh, shows the potential complexity of that world. Uh, this is from a textbook published uh, 10 years ago by a gentleman named Joseph Weiss, uh, and it's called Protecting um, Cyber Security uh, Environments from Electronic Attacks. Uh, very, very useful reference, and I do have a set of references at the end of this material, and we are able to provide copies of this presentation if you like. If we look at this diagram, we see a number of uh, interesting um, features, first of which is there is a tremendous burden of legacy systems, of proprietary environments uh, connecting these. On the tap, we have our historical archives, we have our uh, engineering operator workstations. Uh, these are computers and databases. Um, they communicate over an ethernet link or starting around 20 years ago, uh, they began communicating over TCP IP. You see, there was a, a significant shift in the ICT environment to begin taking advantage of what the engineering community felt was leading edge uh, communications and networking technology um, as shown in uh, the Windows environment. And so we had uh, systems that used to use proprietary ethernet, used to use proprietary uh, cabling, uh, converting to TCP IP. We also saw the industrial protocols, uh, Modbus, uh, DNP3 and so on, also um, shifting to provide uh, TCP based uh, versions. Modbus by itself uh, is entirely proprietary. Many of these industrial protocols are so proprietary, they're as obscure and as simple as Morse code. And that means they don't do encryption. It means they don't do any kind of authentication. It means there's no message integrity, no digital signature capability. It's just very, very raw. It's the old concept of if you want it on, you flick the switch. And if you want it off, you flick the switch down. And the electronic signals are no more sophisticated than that. And these different communications protocols and the different buses over which they travel are very diverse. Uh, ABB, company formerly known as ASEA Brown Boveri, has over 20 proprietary protocols itself just to communicate among its own technologies. And so what we see in this diagram on the top is the, if you will, hub. 
And then in the middle, in bold, you see the range of protocols and connections that link this hub to the various devices. They could be robots on the shop floor. They could be pumps and sensors in a water processing environment. They could be building control systems in a, uh, in a smart building. Uh, they could be uh, subsystems that are components of a smart port uh, or a smart factory or a smart warehouse. The point is that we have many, many years, decades of legacy technology deployed there. And that creates additional problems when you get into these blended heterogeneous environments. <clears throat> and notice that I haven't even started talking yet about conventional IT. We'll get to that in a moment. On the next slide, uh, looking at the vulnerabilities uh, to simplify and highlight what can go wrong. Uh, the first point is uh, shadow OT. Uh, you may or may not have heard this uh, concept. These are OT devices that officially don't exist. They're not really part uh, of the environment. Um, here's an example of how shadow OT can happen. Um, there's a hospital in southern New Jersey, a uh, 2,000 bed place, and it has um, nurses that run rounds. And one of the wards with about 30 or 40 beds uh, is for people who are in long-term care. Um, nurses run rounds, they take a look on each uh, patient. If anything goes wrong, they have to go back. But the only way they know that something goes wrong is because the patient registers you know, a complaint. They push the button and then the nurse gets up and goes there. So one of the nurses had this bright idea. He said, look, I'm caring for an elderly aunt at home and I got this great piece of technology off the internet. It's a little pad. I put it underneath uh, the sheets. And if the person moves, or if the dampness changes, it'll send an alarm. And I'll take a look at the alarm, and I get up and I go to see, you know, what's happened, is the patient okay? So this nurse talked with the uh, head nurse for the ward, and they said, well, what the heck, you know, they only cost 60 bucks a piece. We'll get one for each uh, bed. And so for, you know, $1,800, a couple grand, they were able to put these uh, inexpensive uh OT devices uh, in each bed. And interestingly enough, customer patient care improved because whenever something changed, patient moved, dampness increased, a nurse was on the job and nurse satisfaction improved. They didn't have to walk rounds because they had a dashboard that told them about uh, the status of every patient. They were already monitoring other stuff. Now they had this additional monitor and it completed the puzzle. Over time, these nurses talked with other nurses. And by the end of the year, don't you know that every bed in this hospital had one of these pads uh, stuck in it? And then the chief of nursing went to the CIO of the hospital and said, can you manage these for us, please? And the CIO said, what have you done? None of these devices were approved. In fact, they used a combination of Bluetooth and cellular connectivity to get the information from the patient bed to the monitoring station. There was no authentication. There was no encryption. Patient data was traveling in the clear. That's shadow OT. And when questioned about this, the nurse said, look, if we were to get hospital beds that are fully FDA approved with this level of sensing, they run about $8,000 a piece. And for 2,000 beds in the hospital, that's a $16 million capital investment. That would never be approved. There are other things we would do with $16 million rather than upgrade our hospital beds. But look, at 50, 60 bucks a piece across 40 wards, we were able to get all 2,000 of these beds covered for 120 grand. And it was done incrementally, so it never busts through any threshold. That's shadow OT. People are smart. They'll use technology to solve problems. At some point, they don't even know that they're violating a, a policy or a problem. So the message there is unknown devices are a risk. Insecure authentication, uh, those are simply devices that don't check to see who's asking them. This could be an unauthorized person getting to an engineering workstation. It could be an unauthorized program. It could be malware that gets loaded onto a station. We talk about insecure protocols. 
They're simple. They're unencrypted. They're unauthenticated. There's no uh, message uh, uh, validation. Uh, there's no data integrity check on it, which means that if you can find a way into the network, you can perform replay attacks, you can generate spurious messages, you can turn devices on and off, and there's very little logging. You don't even know exactly what happened. The forensic investigation of these is, is quite complex. Unpatched devices, uh, this is um, very problematic. Um, in an IT environment, there is a patching cycle, and certainly you, know, you don't patch everything all the time. You take a criticality uh, assessment before you decide. But if something really serious is coming down the pike, you make time to patch it. In an OT environment, that may not be even feasible. The devices themselves may be locked up. Uh, we had an incident about a year and a half ago where a semiconductor factory, one of the largest in the world, was hit with malware. What had happened was a technician had brought their laptop in to take some readings from one of the robots and unwittingly uploaded some malware that shot through that factory. 100,000 devices were infected at a period of 40 seconds. You could barely see how fast this infection was moving across the environment. Why did it go so quickly? Because the robots were running a original and unpatched original version of Windows 7. And the manufacturer had said, you know, if you remove this panel, you void the warranty on this device. So you can't patch the devices. In some cases, you can't patch devices because uh, you can't take the system down. It can't go offline long enough to do that. And alongside with that is you can't take the system, the system's processing power away for the purpose of running a, a, a virus scan, a malware scan. There are environments where um, we're talking about the hospital healthcare environment where devices are approved by the FDA for use in healthcare settings, but that approval means that once it's put in place, it can't be changed. And modifying the software is changing the device. Getting a device recertified can take two to five years or more, which means that when you go into a hospital in the United States today, the equipment you're seeing is using software that generally is five to 10 years old and certainly has not been patched within the last 24 to 36 months because of uh, procedural concerns uh, about the integrity of the certification. And finally, you have to talk about the uh, insider threat. The person like that uh, gentleman who accidentally introduced the virus or you know, more uh, uh, surreptitiously uh, the individual who is said to have brought the USB stick that took Stuxnet into the Iranian centrifuges. All of these vulnerabilities uh, take advantage of the fact that this environment is raw and simple and primitive and unconstrained. So let's dive a little deeper onto what kinds of things we see inside this environment where the, where the difficulties actually reside. There are devices called protocol converters. Why would you use a protocol converter? because the instrument that's being monitored was put in place 15 years ago, pre-IP, a non-standard uh, uh, connectivity, non-standard information bus, and a proprietary protocol. So uh, what do you do? Well, you're not gonna roll the inventory of intelligent devices in your factory or your warehouse or your port uh, just to be able to get uh, IP connectivity. Instead, what you do is you put a little box, inexpensive box, relatively low power, not very complex, in front of that device. So the device shown here on the bottom is talking, you know, 1996 era uh, Modbus. But the protocol converter is taking that information and converting it maybe to Modbus over IP. So it goes up to the gateway, and when it comes out on the other end, now you're talking about a TCP IP network and about very straightforward Modbus over IP uh, traffic. Sounds good, except that these, these converters themselves 
are extremely primitive. They're very simple. They're designed to be cheap. The expectation is that you're going to have a bunch of them. So they don't have the processing power to do any kind of authentication. They're very simple devices. They're, uh, we used to call uh, dumb terminals, uh, non-programmable devices. But the reality is that these things are, in fact, quite smart. They're full of functioning computers. It's just that the amount of horsepower and storage and network bandwidth available does not allow them to be used efficiently uh, to do any of the security functions you'd expect from a firewall, say, in a, tri- in a typical uh, IT environment. So these protocol converters sit all over the network in front of every piece of equipment that is using some other protocol, every piece of legacy gear. And remember, these things will live 20, 30, or 40 years before they're replaced. They don't wear out. They don't break down. Um, and these devices are easy to hijack. They're easy to subvert. They're easy to take over. And so protocol gateways are a very, very significant vulnerability. The theory of information security behind these OT networks is anybody inside is trusted and anybody outside is not trusted. This fundamental flawed notion of a perimeter has been shown again and again uh, to not work. And yet it's a design principle and Here's one of the instances where it gets into trouble. Another place where it gets into trouble has to do with industrial robots. Now, these are, again, fully functioning computers that are able to manage the state of programmable devices. You see the robotic arm on the top there. You see the operator on the left giving a command to say, you know, move this 30 degrees to left along a particular axis. The challenge here is not only are these devices programmable, but the languages that they use are proprietary. When you go from one robot to the next, you learn a different language. And these languages, again, are simple. They're designed to simply allow you to move the device. So there's no logging. There's there's no error checking and correcting of any sophistication. There's no authentication. It gets a command and it does what the command says. The languages themselves are so highly proprietary that no IT security firm would spend the money to build any kind of technology to assess that language, to determine if that object code is correct. In the IT environment, we have significant bodies of code that are open source. Uh, You need a TCP IP stack for something? Uh, take, you know, get thee to GitHub and you'll find some code that can handle the TCP IP stack. And so will a hundred thousand other people. There just aren't that many robots using that particular language to create a big enough shared library that somebody somewhere would take the time to go through it. Now there are shared libraries and there are shared code segments, but they're shared among populations of 50 or a hundred users, not tens of thousands. And so a security researcher just won't take the time to take a look, to assess the vulnerabilities, and to see what to do. And so as a result, we have these powerful programmable devices that not only control machines, but can download input, that can interpret tables, that can generate command strings. They're fully functional, uh, highly powerful uh, computers that are sitting on the network and, again, serve as very, very um, uh, available platforms for attack and subversion. Um, You can continue to use the the device as it is and also use it as a a place to distribute spam or to generate a DDoS attack. Or worse, uh, you can subvert the commands so that instead of moving axis 1 30 degrees, it goes 29.96 degrees and all of the engine blocks that are produced in that are slightly flawed. They're going to wear out much faster than expected, but on visual inspection, there's nothing wrong. And of course, the uh, controlling device says, oh, everything looks fine for me. These things are scary smart, and they are raw and unprotected. Um, so it is a vulnerability in the industrial environment, uh, particularly manufacturing, that we have to uh, that we have to worry about. Another area getting closer to home has to do with uh, smart cars. 
Now, here we have uh, two networks. There are the in-vehicle sensors, and then there is the uh, support architecture around it. The support architecture includes uh, everything from uh, the GPS world uh, all the way to uh, collision avoidance uh, entirely inboard. Um, future things to come would be sensors that would allow cars to align themselves efficiently so that you have five cars that are all heading in the same direction. They form an aerodynamically efficient chain, sort of a, you know, on the fly railroad, and they whiz along the freeway in that direction. And then as uh, various cars reach their particular destinations, they uh, peel off. Uh, this kind of efficiency will uh, reduce accidents. It will improve fuel efficiency and it will maximize uh, utilization of available road space. Now, you have to be able to uh, know what are the weather conditions like, what are the traffic conditions like, are there any warnings, are there any uh, reasons you need to change your route. Um, again, here, there is very little to guarantee that the information that the car is getting is correct. These sensors can be subverted, they're inexpensive and they can be forged. They can generate incorrect information. The onboard devices, in some cases, have no protection whatsoever on update. In one vehicle manufacturer's case, if you put a USB stick into the device, into the car, and it has a file called update.exe, that software in that car will run that file without doing any kind of checking on size, on length, on date, none at all. It's got the right name, it's on a USB in my port, and I am gonna execute that. And the platform on which the car is running is, in this particular instance, Windows 7. Now, car manufacturers are beginning to get better. Um, they are taking advantage of uh, toolkits uh, to protect the in-vehicle infotainment, that's the screen, that's the thing where the human interface begins. That's the service that gives you your Bluetooth, that allows you to route your phone through the car's uh, audio system. But that in-vehicle infotainment system is also connected to all the other buses. The car is a totally flat network. There's no firewalling, but there are multiple protocols. The CAN bus, the fundamental automotive protocol is a very low speed, very simple protocol, a very small number of verbs, a very small number of commands, no logging, uh, no backup. It's very easy to replay or uh, forge uh, messages, uh, which is why taking over automobiles has been a feature of uh, conferences uh, with um, capture the flag exercises um, since uh, 2015 when I believe that was the year that uh, the Jeeps uh, were attacked. The point is that here again, we've got a flat, open, simple, unprotected network with no inherent security features, no authentication, no message validation, no message integrity measures, no logging, uh, sitting out there uh, and connected to just about everything because that in-vehicle infotainment, the GPS, the Bluetooth connectivity, uh, mean that there are lots and lots of ways to get into that device. Moving from the earth to the sky, this picture is an artist's representation of satellites about two years ago. Each of those dots represents an object of at least 10 centimeters in size, um, traveling at, if they're in a stable orbit, 18,000 miles an hour or faster. Um, and they live in uh, zones. Now, there was a astrophysicist named Kessler. And in 1978, he said, gee, if we got all these things running around in space, if there is a collision, the debris from the collision could then cause other collisions. And you would run the risk of a chain reaction where the impact of one satellite on another can end up taking out a whole bunch of satellites and, and eventually even pollute a zone so that satellites uh, can't operate effectively and safely in there. Um, about 
six or seven years ago, a defunct uh, Soviet era communication satellite ran into uh, one of the satellites of the Iridium constellation and created a debris cloud uh, that has, in fact, blocked off uh, part of the uh, available space. The Hubble telescope was moved higher. The International Space Station was moved higher in order to avoid debris from this. Hubble orbits about 300 miles up the International Space Station, about 150. They had to go into higher orbits to avoid this. And if you have been following uh, recent uh, events, you know that there are companies putting up dozens and dozens of satellites. We had one launch recently that put over 60 satellites in orbit at one time on a one launch vehicle, which means this area is getting more and more crowded. Here the problem is physics means it's very tough to figure out exactly where these things are going. Uh, gravity isn't smooth and uniform. There are slight ripples. Uh, and so the projected uh, trajectories are not exact and we do see the risk of collisions. What's worse is we see various um, fallen superpowers attempting to uh, define uh, anti-satellite weapons. And so we've seen uh, Russian, Chinese, uh, Indian um, uh, space uh, organizations actually uh, attempting to collide satellites for the purpose of validating the uh, uh, the integrity of their anti-satellite measures. And of course, a successful collision creates uh, dozens or hundreds of pieces of debris, which further uh, pollutes the environment. So this world, as, as fanciful as it may seem, as attractive as the notion of satellites may be, um, satellites are just IoT devices that happen to be a long way away. They're small. Um, weight is the enemy of a satellite's longevity. They are relatively low power because the more power you put in them, the more weight that takes. They're relatively simple because the more complexity you put into their operation, the greater the likelihood of a software defect uh, knocking the thing out. And so these are a cloud. These form a cloud of IoT devices that in addition to being relatively vulnerable and easy to take over, uh, are in fact um, creating trouble uh, in their own network with the uh, consequence of collisions. There have been instances of satellite takeovers in 1999. A British military satellite was hijacked. Um, it was taken back in 2006. A couple of the uh, GEOS, Global Earth Observing System satellites, uh, jointly owned by Russia, uh, by, I'm sorry, not Russia, by the U.S. and Germany, uh, were shifted in position. One had its solar panels angled to be uh, facing straight at the sun. Uh, that caused a spike in the generated voltage, which burned out uh, the satellite mechanisms. Uh, again, satellites are very easy to hack, uh, and the consequences uh, can be uh, devastating. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had this event uh, with the global positioning satellites. What had happened was uh, there's a counter in the satellite. A GPS satellite has to know what time it is because it has to know how long it's been up, uh, and it uses that to figure out where it actually is. So it starts a timer, and GPS satellite software's timer is the same as you're familiar with from PCs and uh, Linux systems. The beginning of time is January 1980. Uh, the counter ticks over uh, once for every um, millisecond, which means that after uh, 20 years, this counter, which is only 10 bits long, uh, rolls over. After a certain period of time, 20 years, slightly less than 20 years, uh, these uh, counters roll over, and here's what happened in China uh, in um, April. Some Boeing 787s picked up the date of August 22nd, 1999. That bad date meant that the pilot couldn't trust uh, the device. I mean, the airspeed is this, the altitude's that, the heading's that, and by the way, today is uh, August 22nd of 1999. Say, so, well, I'm looking at my my watch, and when I got in the plane, it was telling me we're in April of uh, 2019. So this 
20 uh, year rollover is a problem. In this case, the issue is not a software defect. It's not the result of a hack. It is an architectural flaw where someone decided that a 10 bit counter was sufficient to capture the number of weeks that have happened. Because when these things were originally put up there, nobody thought they would last 20 years. Well, guess what? Some of these satellites have been up for 40 years and they're still going. Now there's a fix, which is to change the software to use a 16-bit counter. In the case of older satellites, you can't do that. You can't go up there and replace the hardware. What you do instead is you go up there and electronically, through programming, reset the start date. So we fixed the problem that we had last April, and we're going to have the same problem again in 2038 when they'll roll over uh, yet again. Either those satellites won't be there or people will take advantage of the warnings. There were warnings more than a year in advance from the FAA that this was going to happen. Uh, nobody knew uh, what uh, systems were connected and depended on GPS. Um, they found out the hard way. One side effect of this rollover was New York City's wireless internet crashed. Uh, New York City has a uh, system where consumers can walk up to uh, devices and ask for parking. They can order tickets to theaters. They can check how long the line is at restaurants. And that system crashed at 7.59 p.m. on the 6th, which is midnight uh, Greenwich Standard Time. April 7th, that was when the rollover happened and the systems were down for 10 days. It took them a long time to fix. Let's move into the home environment, the smart building. Here we're looking at a complex IoT environment. That is a home that has more than 10 intelligent devices. When you have more than 10 intelligent devices, you've got a burglar arm, you've got um, sensors on the windows and doors, you've got motion detector cameras and they're all working together, you're not going to be able to control that uh, one device at a time. You're not going to pull out your uh, smartphone and take a look at 10 different screens to see if the home is safe. Instead, you're going to use a home automation script. The scripts that run these devices are typically over 1,400 lines of code. This is the result of research that colleagues of ours did uh, last year, and the results were presented at RSA uh, last spring. The problem with these scripts is they're flat languages. They're simple Python-like scripts. There's no way to check uh, anything other than syntax. So if you can hack into the uh, platform that's running the script, you can introduce other devices uh, spuriously. You can, again, generate alerts. Uh, if the system is looking for 10 windows to be closed, uh, you simply create an 11th spurious device, have it signal that it's closed, but you leave one of the real windows open. The software will say, okay, I've got 10 devices closed, everything's great, and then the bad guy's able to sneak in through the unlocked window that was undetected by the protocol. These kinds of problems are endemic. More complex homes get more sophisticated stuff. Do not expect that you are entirely safe from uh, this kind of risk. Here is my home. <laughs> I, have, I have one intelligent device. It's the Nest thermostat. I've got a Bose speaker. Uh, I've got a piece of medical equipment. Um, and what you see here are the devices and their connections. The router to the world is at the top left. I have a uh, piece of uh, hardware that I actually use to uh, isolate my home system. Uh, the connections that go around that, as you see, there are a bunch of things that are unterminated. Um, down at the bottom, you see the uh, cord that connects my uh, home router, my DSL router to my uh, my uh, all-in-one uh, printer, uh, that is not physically connected unless I need to send a fax, the amount of spam calls and such. The point is that complexity can grow really, really fast. This does not have all the devices. That camera and this microphone are not even shown on this because they're subnetworks. The four devices that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that are connected to my uh, UPS. That way I can keep going even if there's a power glitch uh, with uh, recording or participating in Zoom sessions. 
So what do we do about it? The fundamental architectural model here shows OT on the left, IT on the right, and the web beyond it. This is an ideal environment. Again, this is an echo of a perimeter type strategy, but the reality is that you need to put sensors and controls everywhere you can, certainly on the human machine interface, the HMI devices, we call them consoles in the IT business, that are on the left. You wanna see what kind of traffic is going to and from those. You wanna see what kind of messages are flowing from the sensors over the proprietary networks to the supervisory devices. You wanna be careful about what kind of information is allowed into and out of the network. And today, remembering the power of uh, wireless connectivity, uh, this is a daunting task. To get a little more real, to drill into it a little more deeply, we're looking here at specific remediation for Industry 4.0. On the left, the stack is the uh, Purdue model. Uh, we have the most uh, simple devices, the uh, physical controllers at the edge at level zero. And we see what kinds of measures should be put in place to prevent, to detect, and to, over the long term, continue uh, the operation of the environment. The principles for industrial control systems are continuity of operations and preservation of the service. The concepts from information security of confidentiality, availability, and integrity do not even factor in there because the availability that we talk about in IT is the availability of data. The service availability that they speak of in industrial control systems is the underlying service, the service of the water flowing through the pipe, the escalator continuing to run, the traffic lights functioning, even if their network backbone is down. So what do we do at home? Here are a few slides on corrections. You might ask yourself, what's all this with passwords? So I'm gonna say that you've gone to your favorite club and after a nice dinner, you went outside to the deck, looked out over the water, and then you heard a dog bark and you thought, wow, that'd be a great password. I've got my pipe and I'm at the club. So how long would it take to pass to check the password club pipe. I'm just doing a brute force attack with today's level of technology. What if I decide to go longer? I'll use upper and lower case and letters. What if I decide to go really long and use special characters? Well, here are the answers. With contemporary technology, cracking an eight character small lowercase letter password will take about five seconds. If you do club pipe wave barking, that's 16 billion years. And you didn't need to use upper lower case. You didn't need to use special characters. You didn't need to use numbers. And club pipe wave barking is a heck of a lot easier to remember than the next one. And even if Moore's Law nibbles a bit a, uh, a year away from the strength of these things, remember two to the 10th is 10 to the third. So even if, you put a password like club pipe wave barking in place and leave it there for a decade, you're still talking about 16 million years to crack the device. So just use a long password, something easy to remember, but just make it long. Length is your friend here. Quickly going through the remaining remediation. For the home office, if you've got computers or servers being centrally managed, great. They can put all sorts of good technology. You should practice recovering from an attack. You should isolate personal systems from corporate systems to the extent possible and make sure you're doing your updates. Where you can use two-factor authentication. All my social media is two-factor these days. For mobile devices, <clears throat> make sure that you keep those systems current. It's easy to run updates. Turn off Bluetooth if you're not using it. Be careful about where you download apps from and be um, be picky about what apps you choose. If you get a call from an unknown number, don't call them back. That's very likely a callback scam. You'll be induced to get into a long conversation while you're being billed extremely expensive rates for those minutes. Use long, strong passwords where you can. Don't put personal data in websites and consider using some kind of a security uh, product even on the mobile phone. For the remote office, uh, use a firewall. Keep security software current. 
and run backups, both on-premise and use backup to cloud. Here are the references that I mentioned. Again, we'll make this available. And that brings me to the end of the prepared remarks. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. So one question that I'm sometimes asked is, overall, do we think things are getting better or worse? And my perspective is we learn more and more about the vulnerabilities in industrial control systems and IoT. As a result, we actually are able to develop more intelligent countermeasures. Understand that programming evolved separately from industrial engineering. It's an offshoot of electrical engineering, which is where computer science began. So being able to say it's getting better is basically a test of the fact that we're actually becoming engineers over time. Um, what I mean by that is uh, if a science consists of a study of natural phenomenon to uncover root causes, uh, then engineering is the study of uh, physically built phenomenon to understand uh, relationships and safety protocols. And as, uh, as we are now, um, software actually isn't engineering yet. Um, Peter Nauer said we ought to call it datology. It becomes engineering when we start looking at core issues and, and begin categorizing types of defects, uh, types of solutions, uh, repeatable patterns that are trustworthy. Um, shared code is an example of the beginnings of an engineering discipline. Uh, however, uh, what defines an appropriate interface is still very much art, meaning it's very much dependent on an individual. Um, that art has not transferred yet to um, industrial systems uh, outside of specific domains. We mentioned the problem of uh, each robotic manufacturer having their own language, uh, communities of users of these uh, robots using that particular language have shared code pools, but there's no uh, underlying uh, theory about what makes a good subroutine or what makes a good program. We're moving in that direction. We understand the vulnerabilities with protocol converters. We did not a few years ago. As a result, we're not able to critique an engineering uh, control system schematic and say, these are areas where vulnerabilities will fall off. And in the industrial control systems disciplines, we have um, the ability to go in using the um, hazard analysis uh, protocols uh, to say, okay, we can look at cyber hazards. And we can then, again, begin to use an engineering-like discipline to say, do we have a buffer overflow? Do we have the use of the variable without having validated its actual existence? There are certain classes of problems that we know how to solve. So the answer is cautiously, yes, things are getting better, not as fast as some of us would like, but they are. Most importantly, the so-called convergence uh, between IT and OT, uh, it doesn't mean convergence in the sense that I'll be doing your job and you'll be doing mine. It doesn't mean convergence in the sense that I'll be using a Windows PC instead of industrial control system. What it means is that we're now seeing many, many more place, places of interface between the technologies and their cross-pollination of ideas, uh, teams made up of members 
from both communities uh, will it be able to discuss and discover uh, areas where problems abide? I have another question that's just come in. How do we balance the need to have open interoperable systems and keeping them secure, especially legacy? Well, the uh, concern about open and operable systems doesn't necessarily mean they will be insecure. Uh, the concern with open operable systems is that uh, who can get access to them and what basic principles of cyber hygiene are we able to enforce in these systems? We have certainly used uh, open software within the IT community for a long, long time. Um, the proprietary version uh, didn't prove itself to be superior in terms of uh, code quality. Uh, the dream that because the code is open and shared development and therefore you'd have millions of people looking at it and everything would be checked for defects that also uh, turned out to be an illusion. Yeah, the code's available to everybody, but the number of people actually spend their time looking for defects is very small relative to the total user population and the defects that have shown up through shared code have proved just as devastating as the defects that have shown up through proprietary but widely used code. So the overall point would be when you deploy technology, you as the consumer of that should be able to describe what interfaces are in place to protect that stuff, uh, maintain the integrity of that environment, uh, and keep it uh, clean and pure and secure to the extent you can. Now, I'm not advocating you go out and buy something. Uh, I'd rather you didn't. Um, what we found, in fact, is that in many cases, uh, organizations have too much security technology, too many products from too many vendors already. And that's happened because over time, new requirements come up and nobody thinks to go back and take a look at the existing inventory and say, has this problem been solved somewhere? It is rather surprising for middle-sized to large organizations when they do actually survey their installed software base for them to discover that many of the problems they have have already been solved by tools they've already deployed and know how to use and are currently paying for. It's just that they haven't kept up with the releases of what's new with this product. Every security vendor that I am aware of, and I'm speaking here not just from my three years with Trend Micro, but going back to my 11 years with Gartner, every so software uh, security vendor I know of is constantly facing the challenge of getting the install base to migrate to current releases. The presumption is I put the thing in, it's working, there's no more I need to do with it. Well, that's not really quite the way software works. As the software increases in capability, keep up, take a look, see what's new, see what might actually be around that now fits a different need. Vendors change hands, vendors change products, and products are continually evolving. So stay on top of that. I don't believe that we have any more questions in the stream now. I want to thank you for your time and attention. And if you need copies of this, you can reach me through the ISC West team. Um, happy to provide uh, background, uh, happy to provide the references. Thank you very much and have a great day.